Welcome everybody. As you start filling it in here, I'm going to give folks a minute to get settled, but if you would like to share in the chat a favorite game that you have played recently, go ahead and share. I've been playing a lot of Stray. I know I said that at our, our session last week, but I'm still kind of obsessed with that game because you get to be a cat and run around and be cute and stuff and get bags stuck on your head. Have you I mean, done the some... mod yet where you can customize your cat? I have not done the mod. And I also just heard uh, that there's a mod where you can do multiplayer split screen, which is also exciting. Um, some bugs, but I'm kind of interested in checking that out. But yeah, I would love to mod the cat to look like my own. The starter cat that you have looks a little bit like one of my cats, which is part of why I love the game. But I have five cats, so I could like cycle them out. <laughs> OK, so let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to the next installation of GameRT's webinar series. I'm Rebecca Strang, the current GameRT president, and I am a children's librarian at Naperville Public Library in the western suburbs of Chicago. I am here today for tech and Q&A support. This event is being recorded. The recording will be available to GameRT members for six months before becoming publicly available on the GameRT website. We're also live streaming the session to Twitch, so hello to anybody out there on Twitch watching us. The Twitch video on demand will be accessible after the six month members only period. And if you're not following us uh, on game on Twitch already, please give us a follow so we can build up that channel. I'll be throwing some links in the chat a little later. And for anybody who was not previously familiar with GameRT, we are the Games and Gaming Roundtable of the American Library Association. Our mission is to promote gaming in libraries, whether that's programming, collection development, community building, prototyping, playtesting, research, fun, we want it all. Um, GameRT has two professional development web series. We have our webinar series and a learn and play series. These events usually alternate each month. Um, this month is special because we've got a second one. So today we've got our uh, webinar on building interactive mystery hunts and soon we'll meet the panel for that discussion. But first, I would like to share with you some other upcoming events. In August, on August 10th, we will have a webinar on beginning a circulating RPG collection. And then another session in August where we're gonna be partnering with the Film and Media Roundtable we're going to have a webinar on new realities, new horizons, augmented and virtual reality in libraries, classrooms, and development. And then also coming up in August, we're going to be doing some more live stream gaming on Twitch. So keep your eye out for announcements on those dates where we're going to be playing. We also might have some calls for player participants. So keep an eye out on GameRT Facebook and Discord and all of that for those announcements. So let me uh, get started by introducing our panel today. We have Amber Sewell, who is a teaching and learning librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She is interested in games and storytelling for instruction and how instructional design and creativity can create engaging and effective learning experiences. She incorporates gaming into her work whenever possible, including designing short games for classroom use, working on cyber or murder mystery events, and more. And as a gamer herself, she's a big fan of board games, running a virtual cat cafe, and playing D&D &D whenever she can find a local group. We also have Danielle Costello, a reference librarian for Louisiana State University, where she teaches library instruction and develops game programming. She's a member at large for the Games and Gaming Roundtable and the new co-chair for GameRT's uh, Events Programming Committee. Her research interests lay in the benefits of gaming for higher education, the use of games in instruction, and the incorporation of games into outreach and community building. We also have Liz Brown, who is a support staff member at the Baltimore County Public Library and recent graduate of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign MLIS program. Yay, me too. <laughs> She's the treasurer for the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable and the secretary for the Games and Gaming Roundtable for the 2022-2023 year. So she's got her plate full. 
Uh, her research interests include the preservation of small press and self-published collections, grant writing, mentorship practices, accessibility, sustainability, equitable, equitable practices, as well as library programs and events. She uses her fine arts background as much as possible in her work, which we super greatly appreciate. <laughs> And we also have Celine Holmes, a librarian uh, in the Information Services Department Chair at Academy of Sacred Heart in New Orleans, Louisiana. She is a member at large for ALA's Graphic Novels round and Comics Roundtable and a member of the gaming, Games and Gaming Roundtable. She also serves on the Louisiana Young Readers Choice Award Committee and is a board member of the New Orleans Information Literacy Collective. She is uh, with a teaching uh, in Primary Sources Network Mentor. And we also have a couple members who could not be here today, but we have their notes, so we'll have all of that information. Uh, so let's get started and dive into our questions for today. And if anybody uh, watching has questions as we're going along, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to get those questions submitted. As I see those come in, I'm gonna try to insert those while we're talking about the topic instead of holding everything to the end. So go ahead and feel free to use the Q&A feature um, or use the chat. So up first, here, let me pull up our question list. So how did you all get started with building the escape room for LibLearnX and eventually for ALA Annual? I'll go first because I was kind of the uh, point of contact for that. Uh, I'd been talking at our board meeting about using escape rooms and how we've used them at our university for um, uh, open house events. And then Tina Coleman, our ALA rep, was like, ooh, Libler Next is coming up and we would like to do something and it's virtual. We would like that. Can you do it? And I was like, I mean, sure. And so we um, kind of co coordinated and got together and put the word out. We would like to be doing this. Please help. And um, that's kind of how it got started was I was already doing a little bit of work in them and then got a chance for a an ALA was excited about the opportunity to have them in a virtual ex uh, kind of um, place an experience for everybody to enjoy and then for annual we're just like well let's just do it again yeah why not because it was a ton of fun at live learn x definitely um so once it got going uh why why escape rooms for these conferences I think one of the cool things about escape rooms, I use them a lot um, in my elementary school actually. And there's so much that you can incorporate into them and into the different kinds of games. And they use so many different skill sets too to try to solve the puzzles. Um, and so there's all of that. And then it's also super fun. Um, and especially for LibLearnX, I think when we were like, it was virtual, it was a way for everybody to kind of come together and do something together and um, have something interactive that you could be a part of for the conference. I think one of the reasons I really liked escape rooms for this experience is ALA wanted to highlight a lot of different resources for its membership, but just having a list of, hello everyone, here's stuff we recommend isn't exciting or fun and engaging. So they wanted a way to kind of get eyes on those resources in a way that felt exciting rather than, well, thanks. I'm um, just like, you know, kind of a flyer you hand and then, you know, drop it into the dumpster. Instead with escape rooms, we took those different areas and we're like, okay, this is part of the puzzle. You getting eyes on it means that you've played the puzzle, you've engaged with it, we know where you've gone to, but also that, you know, you had a fun journey and an exciting experience along the way. Yeah, it's definitely fun to have that that interactive component, uh, especially when it was virtual and now back to in person. It's so yeah. fun. 
<laughs> oh, and one more point on that is um, because rather than having like a webinar or an engaged experience, one thing we are very cognizant about for both LibLearnX and Annual was everybody's going to conference for not our shenanigans. And so having an asynchronous event allowed people to engage as much as they wanted when they could, as well as after hours as well without monitoring from us. So it was a nice way of a lot of people can play together and enjoy this experience without so much work on our end either. And uh, it looked like chat was disabled, but it should be available for everybody to chat with everybody now, in case you were looking for that. Um, so once you, you decided on doing um, escape rooms, what did you use for inspiration when building these virtual escape rooms? I feel like Danielle was kind of our mastermind for all of this, uh, but she provided a template for us. It was like, here's how many clues we're going to need. These are the sources that need to be highlighted. Uh, and then we kind of had like free reign when it came to the individual puzzles. Um, like I said, Danielle had already figured out how everything was going to relate to each other. My brain. I don't know that 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 would be ambitious for me to take on at this point, um, but yeah, we really got to pick, and that was part of the fun thing about the escape room, is that format allowed us to incorporate different levels of difficulty, different styles of puzzles, um, and so escape room had a general format, but the individual puzzles that made up that escape room uh, were really flexible, which was one thing that I really liked about creating this experience. And in terms of uh sort of picking an idea and running with it, we really riffed off of one another. And because we were very focused on making it an enjoyable experience, anything that made us all laugh, we were like, yes, let's, let's, do, let's do that. So we definitely, um, it's definitely one of the more casual elements of ALA that is out there. <laughs> I think we definitely took inspiration for Libler and X's um, escape room with conferences we've all been together with and kind of because um, we knew the audience we wanted to hit were other librarians. So it's like, well, what have we all been to a conference and done? Oh, we've been to craft table and the muffins have been a disappointment. So let's go into that. Or the exhibit hall is huge and has so many different things and it's so confusing. So we riffed into that. And so that was a, like, the really great thing about escape rooms is like you're kind of enhancing uh, our experience you already know and kind of really dialing into the humor of that uh, for um, kind of in creating the overall structure because thank you Amber for calling me a mastermind I'm more like master um, looking at examples for other people and taking them and using them myself uh, so both Sun Prairie Public Library um, and the County Library at Salt Lake ha, um, and Cambridge Public Library, and these are included in your resources, made a giant master list of digital escape rooms and activities. And I went through all of them was like, this is a very incredibly easy format. Most people have Google. If you have internet access, you'll be able to play them. Google Forms is very intuitive, Google Slides, Google, uh, and we'll show you the back end kind of work of all these um, in a little bit. but. Everything was created using resources we knew were accessible for our people playing, but also would be accessible when they eventually wanted to take those, um, uh, make the games themselves. And so we wanted to use kind of formats and areas that were easy and intuitive to use. Great. So um, you've got your inspiration, you know you're making an escape room. So how did you go about working out the timeline for building everything? I think I gave us a month for each kind of area. So it started in October, was like, okay, we're gonna kind of plan and think of some ideas and toss around the hat. November, we need to start kind of narrowing in. December is a waste because we all have a million things, also the holiday season. And then January 22nd was Libler Next. And so it's like, okay, between holiday season and the first week of that month, we need to do play testing. So we kind of worked on, okay, I'm going to give ourselves like at least a month to do all the various parts. And what 
always happens, I feel, is we kind of get lost in the weeds and we're like, ah, play testing. We don't need that when we do. We need to give ourselves lots and lots of time for play testing. But it was mostly like a month for each thing and let's see how that feels. And then a lot of checking in towards the end. I think that's we were um, pretty much contacting each other every week, like, hey, does everything look good? Is everything okay? Okay, it looks good. We play tested all these different things. And it was very similar process for um, annual as well. And then as you were working on those puzzles, how long did it take? I, I know you had several puzzles in each of those uh, mystery hunts, but about how long did it take you guys to come up with a puzzle and then get it play tested and have it ready to go? I think the way Danielle organized it was really great because um, we shared, she shared a Google sheet with us. And so we started off by filling in like, I'm going to take this set of puzzles and I'm going to do this type of puzzle. Um, so as far as me, and I'll say I only worked, um, I played the LibLearn X one, but I only worked helping to build the annual one. Um, for me, building the individual puzzles, I probably spent, I don't know, a couple of hours per puzzle. Um, and again, I'm sort of new to this, so maybe I took longer than others did or didn't spend enough time. <laughs> I don't know, but um, just depending on the type of puzzle, I think it, it varies on how much time you spend doing it. And we were very conscientious about wanting to have different levels of puzzles. So the easy puzzles are okay. Those are not gonna take several hours to put together. You can absolutely riff on existing things that are already out there as long as it's not too easy to Google. Um, so your mileage definitely varies uh, depending on the complexity. For and sure. I think, oh. oh, no, go ahead, Amber. I was gonna say, and um, while we were making the puzzles, there was also some background stuff that was happening at the same time. So like the trailers that are incredible, um, those we could kind of be working on as we're building puzzles, the illustrations, the pictures that are used, um, kind of incorporating the story. Those were elements that um, we were able to kind of build in some things like the story required knowing what thing you were going to click on to get to which puzzle. Um, but a lot of those things we were able to kind of weave into that month that we were building the puzzles. And I think some of the extra time for building things included getting back from ALA kind of the resources they wanted to use because they had a list of some of them, but not all of them. And so some puzzles were held up longer because um, it took a while to figure out, okay, they want us to go to this division, this round table, or this grant to be highlighted. And I feel playtests should be kind of pulled off from the kind of time you're going to allow yourself for puzzle building and just do like three times as much because playtesting takes so, it's like rebuilding the puzzle in a way. So you get the puzzle, you think in your head, it's brilliant and wonderful and I love it so much. And then you give it to somebody and it's like, oh, they weren't in my head either. So always allow, like, I'm gonna probably say this 10,000 times, but more time for that play testing. So if you wanna consider like a puzzle finish when play testing is done, then it takes much more time, but to create a crossword or create a cryptogram or to create kind of all these little puzzles, not as much time, like hour, maybe a day for something very complex. Um. And then, so how did you go about deciding like the kinds of puzzles you wanted to make as you were building this together? I think we all had puzzle types that were like particularly drawn to, like for example, I have been using twine a lot and I think that's really fun. So I was like, can we use some twine puzzles? That'd be great. Um, and then otherwise I was like, I haven't been puzzling for very long in my creative energies ebb and flow so like I'm going to stick with some of the easier puzzles so I know I personally did just some like checking around I'm always collecting um resources for making puzzles and other kinds of like ciphers and stuff so I referred a lot to my notes and was like what do I have the brain space to engage with right now because I know like we had a puzzle that was this google sheet that like had all kinds of work that was put into it and that was amazing um not within my scope as a puzzle maker right now. Um, so I know for me, it was just really like, what puzzles do I enjoy um, and can realistically put in the time and effort to make? Yeah, I think that was nice about having a larger group because we had at least two more members for 
each of the different um, incarnations of the mystery hunt. And it was, we all do definitely kind of have a favorite puzzle type. And so we're able to be like, ooh, ooh, I want to do crazy, you know, shenanigans with um, ciphers. And everybody's like, yes, Danielle, you can do shenanigans with ciphers. You may have that. It's like, excellent. I will go off my corner and like, you know, look like the Zodiac killer and with my, all these ciphers on the wall and things like that. So I, I very much appreciated like having a large group allows you to have the flexibility to have everybody have a different role in the um, uh, puzzle making process. And we also had a master list of puzzle types. And so the, and in our spreadsheet, we made sure to say, this is the puzzle I'm kind of puzzle that I'm using. So somebody already had, okay, we have crosswords, we have this mazes, we have a weird spreadsheet thing going on, then I can be like, okay, well, these are other puzzles that we haven't added to the list as well. And uh, sometimes reverse engineering really helps to determine the workflow. Like if we, for in instances where we knew what the answer needed to be in advance, like pretty far in advance, it was much easier to work back from what is, what do I need a number? Do I need a code word? Uh, what kind of puzzle suits that format? And um, what challenges, aside from like, you know, timing and playtesting, like what other unique challenges did you have with this project working with uh, puzzle building? I know for me, one of the challenges was kind of um, how to balance like that part of my brain that has fun making puzzles with like how I was using my brain at work. So like, there was one puzzle. I made a crossword puzzle. Um, and for some reason, I decided that I needed to sketch it out on a whiteboard. Um, so like I spent a full hour with a sheet of paper trying to draw straight lines to make boxes of the same size. And about like half an hour in, I was like, Amber, there's got to be an easier way to do this. This is, this is silly. Um, and that was mostly just because like I was looking for making the games like a fun way to like not be working on revisions for an article or whatever it was that I was supposed to be doing. Um, so sometimes it was like really easy to go down a rabbit hole of like, I haven't made a crossword puzzle myself before. Um, I'm not going to consult resources on how to do it. I'm just going to go with my gut. And for some reason that was like sketching it out on a whiteboard, which turns out is not the most effective way to make a crossword puzzle. For mine, for um, some of my puzzles for annual, since we were in DC, I wanted to use some of the Library of Congress's primary sources. Um, and one of them was a map. And though I could make it like really big on my screen, one of the challenges I realized was like, can it's gonna be hard for people to find exactly what I'm looking at. Sort of like what Danielle was saying, like they're not in my head, so they don't know to go like directly here to find on the map. And so like, I mean, there was a workaround. I wound up taking like some screenshots of different parts of it so I could zoom in on that. Um, and then I think also something that came up through the play testing was um, for annual, since people were physically there too, some people were gonna be playing this on their phone and things display a lot differently on your mobile device, of course, than on your big screen computer or you know, those of us who are lucky to have like two screens um, or more. Um, so that was a challenge too, to try to figure out how to make it accessible for everybody. Yeah, I'm gonna double um, that, make, not, not realizing you're making the puzzle in your computer and your type of computer is so hard to realize because it's like, wait, why can't you act like you should be able to access it? I'm, I'm in incognito, everything's going well. It's because my monitor is like huge. That's so I, it's one of those really hard things to realize different people are going to play on so many different platforms. The more play testers you have on various platforms, the better it's going to be. Especially I had one uh, friend that play has their computer on uh, dark mode all the time. It's like, I never even thought of that. So my hints, did not work at all. I was just, we were going back and forth for a while trying to figure out what the problem was. So definitely having the challenge with the puzzles is always figuring out, will they work both technically and as mechanically as a puzzle itself? And so the technical part is a little bit trickier to me because the mechanical part's like, okay, I can tweak those 
because I'm thinking about that, but definitely keep the technical part in mind as well. And so those are some of the challenges. What were your favorite fun parts about building these puzzles? I'll say right now, I made red herrings and I loved it. I loved it so much because I was just like, look, I'm just gonna put a, a fish, a red fish up here. And this is my red herring. Because sometimes it's difficult when you don't know it's a red herring and it's mean. I feel spirited in a way because it's like I'm spending like five hours on this one thing. and It's like, oh, it doesn't relate to the puzzle. So I want it to be very obvious. And I think my favorite line I'm most proud of is like, um, I might not know that um, I might not be the salmon of wisdom, but I know something about this. And I'm just like, yes, yes, lean into the puns and the ridiculousness. So being able to be a, a campy like that and to have fun with the puzzles, I think was a nice kind of change from the work I usually do. So I really enjoyed being able to do that. Yeah, similarly, uh, I'm a story gal. And so we had some puzzles that like were tied to objectives. Like we wanted to educate them about this resource. We wanted to like introduce them to this section of a website. Uh, but some of the puzzles were just silly. Um, and so like the twine ones were my favorite uh, where I got to be like, okay, for Live Learn X, it's like, what if Gandalf were just hiding somewhere in the uh, poster hall? What then? What if his poster was just riddles from The Hobbit? Um, and then when we were going into annual, they were like, uh, how about a bunch of doors? Let's have a Narnia themed. Can the twine be Narnia themed? I was like, absolutely. Um, so it was really fun to just kind of have like, here is an inspiration from something we love um, and I just get to be silly with it. So that was, those were some of my absolute favorites was just getting to be like, what would it look like if Gandalf were Libler next? Here's my guess. So kind of building off of that, I would say the most fun part was like putting it together with everybody um, because just our meetings were super fun and silly. And somebody would say like, what about this? Or, oh no, let's do that. And um, so there were like some inside jokes and stuff that um, it, that was fun for me. And I'll just uh, roll on with all of that. Uh, like knowing our audience was like, because when we were designing puzzles or games for the public, like you really have to vet for cultural sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. But for this one, you still vet for, for sensitivity, but like, we, we know our audience, we know our, we know what librarians like. <laughs> so it was really fun to lean into that aspect of the game. Yeah. Um, and a question I think everyone is very eager to hear the answer for, <laughs> What are some of the resources that you all used to research puzzle making and build these puzzles? Uh, so one of my favorites and a huge inspiration for everything is the MIT uh, does a mystery hunt themselves on their campus every year. And they have a wonderful website that has tons of puzzles, all of the mystery hunts that have previously happened. So you can take inspiration from that, but also kind of um, just how, how a puzzle can be crafted from the beginning to the end. So that's an excellent resource, I think, for just the mystery hunt kind of experience and like somebody that's done it over and over and over again successfully. Um, what about the rest of you? Did, did, is there like, if you had to pick a favorite puzzle building resource, what would you recommend? I didn't use it for, oh, so go ahead, Amber. I was just gonna say, I'm gonna be honest, like Google was like, this is, this is the thing I'm interested in doing. How do I do it? Um, my technique was not very sophisticated, but it got you, got the job done. I didn't use it for um, the puzzle for annual, but um, at my school, I love using Jigsaw Planet and you can make a jigsaw puzzle um, and you can take any image that you have. You can add you know, writing to it and stuff. So you can put codes into the puzzle and people have to complete the jigsaw puzzle, the virtual jigsaw puzzle before they get the code word. Um, I also really like SMS generator because it looks like a phone screen and it has like the text messages. So you can put clues in there um, or answers in there and stuff. 
Uh, and this might be jumping ahead a bit, but I took care of a lot of the images for uh, the puzzles and I really like the noun project. I use it for almost any visual project that I'm working on. Uh, it ha gives you, it's you make a, an account and then you have access to thousands of hundreds, hundreds of thousands of vector images that you can really play around with. Um, and that's really how we built up uh, one of the, at least one of the screens for the first uh, Live Learn X puzzle. And they have themed, they, they have more, more than you think you would, like, I can't tell you how many conference uh, images they had, stock conference images they had ready to go and like things like, oh, they'll never have uh, a Ferris wheel. They have it and it's all free to download and use. Oh, and one source I uh, just remembered now is I went on um, into the bookstores and I looked for just puzzle making for tiny kids and for teens, because what's nice about those and like they would be, you know, like 20, 30 different types of puzzles. What's nice about those is it breaks down the elements of what is inherent in a crossword, what is inherent in Sudoku, what is inherent in a logic puzzle. And so from there, you can make things much more complica uh, complicated, but what's nice is you have the base level of different types of puzzles as well. Awesome. So uh, let's move on from resources and talk about learning objectives. Um, I mean, puzzles and, and games are fun, but we can also use them for education, which you all certainly did with the puzzles you built for LibLearn X and Annual. So how do you incorporate those learning objectives into the escape room and the puzzles that you're building? Oh, go ahead, Amber. I saw that you unmuted. Oh, I was just going to say for Live Learn X, we had a list of resources that ALA wanted to be highlighted. Um, and so those were very specific. This is where we would like attention to be drawn. Um, some of us all have interests in different like roundtables um, and different groups that we wanted to highlight. Um, and some of them were just supposed to be fun. I know for me, um, if I picked some of the ones that ALA had already told us, like this is what we'd like to highlight, um, I tried to find something that was maybe visually engaging or um, something that like I already had a puzzle format in mind and I knew that it would work well for this. So like if it's the mission and vision statement and I know I'm gonna have a word related puzzle, this is gonna be an easy way to tie in. Um, or I think I highlighted the um, merchandise page for the conference. And so it's like, okay, math. So I can use numbers to kind of like, what items can you find? Um, so that's how I approached it. Yeah, very similarly, I, um, with a learning objective built puzzle, you work backwards in a lot of ways. You'll look at the thing you want to be highlighted and see if there's um, a, either a pattern, numbers, names that are important, particular kind of sections or keywords that can be broken apart from the main thing you want them to be looking at, and then take that and make a puzzle from it. So um, for example, one of the uh, puzzles that I'm and, and some puzzles are better for using for that. So if you have um, a piece of information that doesn't have numbers, then there are some puzzles that wouldn't work as well. But um, for a puzzle on one of the grants that was offered for um, scholarship, they want, um, I figured what would be really cool would be to know the dates that you would need to be able to put the scholarship in, who would be use, um, the kinds of uh, people who would be able to uh, be in the scholarship. And so I just kind of made a, um, a puzzle that was a question and answer. Um, so multiple choice type puzzle, but then they would have to, from that information, figure out, oh, all those answers to the multiple choice are weird letters. It's not A, B, C, D. It's like these letters that will spell my eventual um, solution that I want them to get to. And so the puzzling didn't necessarily come from like, because multiple choice isn't fun, but from, okay, now that I have the solution to all these multiple choice, what's the next step I need to make? So sometimes you need to make a multi-tier puzzle um, when you're kind of doing a learning objective style puzzle, because figuring out the learning objective might not be as much fun as the next part that you incorporate into it. 
while we were building the puzzles, I was actually taking Katie Horning's um, the Newberry Medal Past, Present, and Future class through ALSC. And um, so I wanted to highlight, it was also the 100th year, 100th anniversary of the Newberry Medal. So I knew I wanted to highlight some of those titles. And I had been fascinated by the fact that they're only like three or four nonfiction Newberry winners out of the 100 years of books. Um, so I kind of focused mine, one of my puzzles on that. Um, and then I also, like I said, I wanted to make people aware that the Library of Congress has all these free primary sources. Um, and so by sending people to the Library of Congress website, um, I felt like that was a learning experience of this is a resource that's available to you. And then um, kind of going back to what Danielle said about like when you're working with educational objectives and putting those into puzzles and trying to you know use multi-tier systems how do you balance the learning with the fun when you're wanting to get a point across but you're trying to make that point fun <laughs> i think that backward design process that danielle was talking about is really key to that um, if you are trying to accomplish something having that goal in mind and working backwards from there uh, is just going to make it easier on you as the person designing the game or the puzzle um, but also on the learner I think it can be really frustrating when you are like playing a thing and you're like trying to figure out what the theme is where is this going and then you get to the end and you're like that's not at all what I thought I was working toward um, and so using that backward design process and really focusing on what you want to accomplish and then the most effective way to do that and I think all of us are very creative and like to have fun. So it's our instinct to build that fun into it. Um, but by working backwards, we're able to ensure that like, while we're having a great time, we're also keeping that end goal, that end learning objective in mind. Um, I think part of it was also when we were building our, um, and I will show, we'll talk about this in, um, or show you in format and organization when we talk about that. We have a master spreadsheet of all of our, different puzzles that we used and we made sure to have at least three just fun silly nonsense puzzles that didn't have a learning objective that were for the joy of doing that puzzle solving that finding those things so when you have learning objective style puzzles it's nice to balance them with just fun silly puzzles as well that are a lot easier less kind of um, mentally rigorous to have to do And there's a question in chat that kind of relates to this. Um, so Kim is asking if there's a list of puzzles that breaks down which puzzles are best for different types of answers. Like earlier, one of you had mentioned that specific puzzles are better for numbers. Um, it's, I don't think we ever had a list that specifically broke that down. It was more through trial and error and like working with puzzles and being familiar with pu different puzzle types that we could see oh, this wouldn't be good for this because this is kind of a, cryptograms need a lot of information to be able to be fun and engaging, I feel like you need to have several sentences. And I don't necessarily want somebody to be looking for several sentences in some of my learning objectives, or this is a really good, it, it takes kind of trial and error and playing around with different puzzle types, I think. Um, maybe a list might be formed later if we um, get to that, maybe. We'll have to keep that in mind for next time, but. As of now, I don't know of any list that kind of talks about that. It also helps to look at your source material because um, for a lot of this, we're, we're linking back to ALA's website. So, you know, if I was assigned, I forget which, which uh, when I was assigned to, I think it may have been like the new members roundtable uh, webpage. I went to that page and I looked through it and I was like, okay, what is on this page that I could distill down very simply into a puzzle? Like, oh, there aren't a lot of numbers on this page it would be really easy for me to, you know, to somehow format my puzzle so that it's based on this web page and you have to find all the numbers and that that's your code and that's the solution. Um, so going back to the source material or whatever you want to teach off of, that can be helpful for determining as well. Um, and then beyond having fun, like one of the best parts about puzzle experiences like this is that it can be immersive and cohesive. So how did you go about deciding on like the theme and the story for the, the puzzles that you were working on? We tossed that all to Amber. We're like, you will be our <laughs> major storyteller because you like story. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think coming up with the overall theme was really a group effort. I think brainstorming as to like, what do we want the like premise for our puzzles to be was like some of the best meetings where we're just throwing out ideas of like, this is a trope from like crime that we really like. And this is like an experience as a librarian that I think everybody will be able to empathize with. And so that's how the overall stories were kind of formed is it would be like, honestly, Live Learn Next was so long ago. I think it was just like a meeting where we all were like, it's our first time doing this puzzle. Let's say this is your first time attending a conference and it's virtual and you like don't know what to do. And I was like, right, let's go from there. Um, for annual, I know there was there were two meetings um, that were kind of brainstorming the theme and story. We knew we wanted to tie back to the story that we'd already started with Live Learn X. Um, so you're a librarian, you were reached out to by the Guild of Mysteries um, to kind of prove your mettle. Um, and so we were like, okay, where do we want to go with that? And so there were two brainstorming meetings. Um, I missed the first and watched the recording and came to the second. And I was able to take things that everybody was really excited about and kind of tie it together into one story that made sense. So people were really excited that like, I forget the technical term for it, but like having a drop site where you can like find things that was something people were really excited about. Um, we wanted to further the story of our Guild of Mysteries. So like, how did we wanna go about that? Um, and so it was really easy. It was kind of a natural process because we all really enjoyed coming up with the scenario. Um, we would sketch out kind of the broad view. Um, and then as the puzzles were being built, um, some people would incorporate their own story. So as they were writing up their puzzle, they would be like, here's the setup that I want for this puzzle. Um, and as things were kind of being built more, I would go back in and kind of add the story context and flush things out. Um, sometimes it would be informed by what the content of the puzzle was itself. Um, often it was linked to like what you were clicking on um, to kind of engage with the puzzle. Um, but really, I just, we decided the theme together and then I would go back through kind of toward the end as we were play testing and kind of coming up on a finished product um, to kind of weave stories into all of the puzzles. So it was kind of interesting trying to balance like you don't know what order players are going to experience these puzzles in. Um, so I couldn't reference like oh you've already seen the talking squirrel. So when you come up on the horse, you're going to expect it to also talk with you. Um, so it was kind of interesting. Um, there were also places where I was able to insert like things that I personally enjoyed, like Talking Squirrel, got a little Emperor's New Groove references thrown in. Um, yeah, it was a really interesting and really fun experience where we like collaboratively brainstormed our initial theme and then I just got kind of got to weave it all in. And structurally that worked out as we have a shared work document folder in Google together and we're just like, Amber, whatever you want to do with my puzzle story wise, it's it's yours now. And I think it worked really well to have trust among each other and not like be like, oh, this is my puzzle. I'm no, it makes coherent. It was coherent because we gave one person an overall ability to kind of talk about what story she wanted to say with some input from us and um, a lot of times it would be Amber insert story here, thanks, bye, um, within the puzzles or within the major sections of the form because I was building the structure itself and Amber was inserting all the flavor and cool stuff and everybody else was working collaboratively. So I think it works when you have a single person that has a vision and to just give them the ability and space to make that vision happen. Yeah, I think that speaks to to just the teamwork, like you have to be collaborative and open to people taking your ideas and shaping them into something that's going to be cohesive. And I feel like librarians are great for that because we're all about like sharing knowledge and resources. So I think that's uh, really great. And just the success of the, the hunt, I think, speaks very well to the team that you all have put together for this. Um, so kudos on that. <laughs> um, now, as for the format and organization of the puzzle, um, why did you decide to go with the format that you did for the escape room? 
Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this um, briefly at the beginning, but the idea was we wanted a format that was really easy ex um, to access both from a player standpoint, but also as a showcase of what librarians could be able to do and access as well. And so we figured Google, excuse me, was one of the easiest, you know, it's free. There's plenty of places to work. People can share it very easily. It's intuitive. There's not much to do. Amber went into Twide and I was like, oh, what's this? And I was like, no, I can't. I can't possibly do that. Let's make a slide instead. There we go. And so there's a lot of very intuitive tools already in Google. You can do escape rooms all over the place, but we wanted specifically this one to make it as easy as possible. And then um, how did you decide on how everything was organized? <laughs> well, let me, um, uh, if I could screen share for a moment, because I know we're talking about organization and people are like, oh, what's going on? Uh, I'd like to show our beautiful behind the scenes kind of nonsense. Yeah, go for so it. So I believe, okay. So this is our shared document for um, LibLearnX. We have um, a couple of different things I'd like to highlight, but first the puzzle work list is where we have, once again, the all the different kind of divisions and roundtables that ALA wanted us to highlight throughout, as well as the websites to those. And then the puzzle focus would be specifically on what part of the graphic novel or what part of e-learning or all the different um, various roundtables specifically even more narrowly focused. And then kind of our objective for what they would be doing on those. Um, when they finally got there, what was the learning objective we wanted? Um, here are the, all the different puzzle members assigned, the puzzle types so we could organize. Also the day, because we had four days of puzzles, we needed to know when we we're play testing, what puzzle were you referring to? You can't just say ciphers, we've used that several times. And so we organized it by day and puzzle number. And then each of these puzzles ended up in a solution with that was a 10 letter word. So instructed, discovered, researched, um, and so we needed to keep track of what letter went to what puzzle number, and then what was the solution. So solution number, the puzzle gets kind of complex because we talk about the number instead of the letter. So they had to figure out the number first to get to the letter. So once again, we needed another tab so we could keep track of that. Whether the puzzles had been reviewed by us before going to play testing to make sure there's a level of, okay, this makes sense. You're not just in your head, you know, creating, you know, clouds in the sky. There, there's actual puzzle here. And then there's the review checks there, miscellaneous notes, as well as here's kind of our build important dates when we want to start, finish building, test, and then the rollout date, which we needed. And then master puzzle solutions. So that way we can kind of keep track and focus. Okay, this is what our end goal is. This is what it needs to be and um, go into um, kind of meta puzzle land. So what that looks like is we, um, so those were our um, kind of the master list of keeping track of everything. But now we have all the puzzles in actual Google, um, uh, just little Google documents. So you can see there's a little bit of what you're interacting with. There's the story of the puzzle and then there's hints below where you could highlight. And then all of that was put onto a room slide. So we have one of our slides here. And so what we did was, eh, yes, it's beautiful, Jessica. You, we would make different um, invisible boxes and make links to them. So you could go and you could click around the room. And we specifically did the question mark. So it would be an eye-catching thing to be able to link to. And then, so those are all the slides we made and linked. And then we had our forms, which is where everybody would play and be able to go into and add information. So here's the exhibit hall, just your basic information to get into the room. And then here's the start of our mystery and what's going on and a little bit of background of what's happening. And then here, because Google Forms doesn't let you link an image, I'd, we would have to always have like a little click here to link, but just one of the small um, things. And then here's where they would have to actually answer, get the password instructed from all the different puzzles they played with previously. Make sure that's required and make sure the response validation is on. Otherwise they can just click through and then congratulations, they've won. And so we did that three more times, four more times. There we go. It was, it was a fun um, bit of nonsense we got ourselves into, but organizing was 
the key to making sure everything flowed and made sense. And then we did it again for, and used the very similar format of putting the forms, putting puzzles, there's miscellaneous notes, and then all the kind of like background FAQs introductions were also there. So that way we could keep reusing them over and over again. And I will stop sharing. So now you can see a little inside my mind. It's a beautiful place and I love it. Um, but yeah, that's how we kind of kept ourselves organized was both the Excel and then making a million folders of different things. So that way we could all share and look and be like, hey, I need you to look at this please. And then, oh, very easily. It's like, okay, that looks good and move on from there. Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of information. You guys are juggling for these. Um, so once you've, it's all organized, you've got all of your parts built and you're ready to get, you know, outside eyes on it. How did you go about um, getting playtesting done and how did playtesting help you um, improve or change uh, this living puzzle? <laughs> Well, since Liz and I are both on the graphic novel and comics round table as well, um, that was kind of, we shared it with um, that group and with the board and um, several people from, um, from the board played as play testers. Um, my husband was also forced to be a play tester. Um, and I don't know that any of my um, coworkers did it, but I also shared it with them, so. Yeah, I have several uh, very competitive uh, puzzlers, but uh, who, who I work with, and they're very eager to be play testers. Um, I think we got we got more a little more feedback for Libler and X than we did for Annual because of the way the timeline and everyone uh, all the other stuff we had going on. SRC uh, looming as, alongside Annual was not a great uh, com competition for people's attention. Um, but yeah, just badgering anyone who you can sort of strong arm into playing, uh, especially since uh, when you tell them they don't, they don't have to do the entire thing. Just, just give me feedback on what you can get around to. Uh, that, it's always appreciated, yeah. And I always let them know the kind of um, play testing I want them to do, whether I want them to do copy play testing, like read through, edit, does the story make sense? Or do I want you to play the puzzles? Please ignore everything story. That has not happened yet. That definitely helps them focus. But I also, um, I think I'm surrounded by people who don't like puzzles, love me very much and will do my nonsense for me. So both my wife and one of my best friends at work are like, what, why are you doing this to me again? But it's great feedback because it's a way of understanding from somebody who doesn't play a lot of this as mind, what you went wrong with and what you didn't explain enough or you know what you didn't set up in the rules or tutorial enough so that way everybody can play as well. So when I know that I have a set of rules and tutorials and a puzzle that my wife can play, then I'm, I'm good because then I've explained everything. And if she can't get it at that point, then it's not anything in the explanation. It's, you know, sometimes people just don't like a certain puzzle, which is nice to build lots of different puzzles. Yeah, I think playtesting was really important for a variety of things. I think for some, like playtesters would catch like, oh, when you did the like, you go to this paragraph, this word, this letter, the letter's wrong. Um, so it's great to catch that. Um, sometimes, you would get two in your head and you things that are obvious to use the puzzle maker are not obvious to the person who is playing the puzzle um sometimes it was an accessibility issue like oh you haven't thought about the color contrast on this image doesn't really work great um for twine especially i use it a lot and love it but uh I'm, i still make mistakes i try to teach myself something new with each one that i make um and oftentimes i totally miss things so um play testers are really great for being able to catch those kind of big and small things like I came to this puzzle and had no idea what you were referencing so please make a hint about this or maybe even embed it into the puzzle because multiple play testers have had that problem and so you just need to like you don't need to hide that from them make it obvious what you're talking about um play tester feedback is essential for this kind of thing yeah and I think Danielle made a great point about getting people who aren't necessarily interested in the thing that you're doing to play test it, be, especially 
it helps you if you're using a bunch of jargon that you work in and you live in every day. But even within our own profession, you're going to run into people who might not know what you're talking about because they, you know, you're an academic librarian and they work in a different field. Uh, so getting people to play test who are outside of the scope of your audience is important. Um, what was one of the most common things you learned from from play testing? It would have to be I, I, where to add more hints. Like this needs more hints because it's so obtuse or just so very unique that like we can't possibly understand it. It's like, okay. And I, I think one of the things I learned very much is like, I get very, like they're my little babies and I get proud of all my little puzzles. And it's like, no, I need to learn to let go. This was not a good puzzle according to the play testers. I must revise and redo. I was also going to say hints. Um, I think like it was really helpful to be reminded that like this is going to be played by people at a conference and maybe they haven't been to a conference in a while and they are there for like work and so they are already like doing other things um, and this is supposed to be fun um, and getting frustrated is not fun. Um, so yeah, definitely just just hints, just add them. It doesn't hurt anything. And hints are great because you don't have to change anything you've already created. You can just tack those on to the bottom of the page and, and hide them that way. Sorry, go ahead, Celine. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say the other thing, another great thing about the hints is it's they're there, but they're not obvious. If you have to go through and highlight them to see the hints, for most of the hints at least, and so as a player, if you don't want, if you want to do it and really challenge yourself, you can challenge yourself to do it without looking at the hints. And then if you're frustrated and you're like, I just want to get this done and solve it, you can go ahead and highlight them and see the hints. Yeah, I, I definitely, when I was building my hints, had a level of, okay, here's a kind of like a small hint. Here's a little bit of clarification to like, okay, if you're down at five and you want the help, then I'm going to give it to you. So here is my most like, you know, without breaking and giving you the actual puzzle, here's what I can tell you. And once again, like everybody said, like it's about engagement. It's like if they want to, they're there for them to engage with. And it's not, you know, breaking the puzzle or breaking the experience. It's part of the experience. Yeah, writing hints is another like art of its own because again, you live in that puzzle. You made it. So what's a hint for you may not be a hint. Like someone else might look at that hint and be like, I. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's why it's really good to have two rounds with the hints in, because then it could be like, oh, these hints were not ex what I thought they were either. <laughs> I think that's where like having us review the puzzles even before play testing was helpful because you know the other people are making puzzles they're in that brain space already and so often um our first round of hints would come from like hey i really struggled with this puzzle i think you need to add this hint like oh thank you so much um so yeah that was really helpful and we went over kind of um in a couple of our uh discussions uh kind of play design theory stuff on do we want to give hints for the overall puzzle itself? So not just like this puzzle, but like the whole like password or the whole everything. And I think we kind of settled on, it should be there somewhere for people who are very frustrated because I'd rather have them be able to get through it rather than no, not at all. You're just going to have to suffer never finishing this escape room, which we felt would be a shame because there's so much fun and cool stuff. And it's a shame if you would just do one puzzle that you're not familiar with and not be able to get it. So we're like, okay, here, if you want them are also hints for every password as well. And then I just, I think I did a single Caesar shift where they, here's how to get them. You could look at them one by one, break glass in case of emergency was also there. And that kind of depends on your puzzle team and your objectives. Our objective was mostly fun and informational. So it, it didn't hurt any. If you're doing something maybe for uh, prizes and things, there's kind of like is it fair to have these here or not versus putting them at the end when like the gifts have been given away and then you can have it, you know, as a open experience, but it depends on what kind of puzzle experience you're doing. Um, and I know we are coming up on two o'clock. We still have some questions that we want to get through, but Danielle, for anybody who has to leave uh, soon, can you do a walkthrough of the resources folder and then we can continue with the rest of the questions? Sure will. So folks can get that before they go. Yes. 
And we'll share. And then, so this is the to build a mystery resource folder. What we've done is we've added um, the puzzle resources I talked about earlier for different types of puzzles. The, a copy of our um, master work list for one of the rooms. So that way you can copy the format of it. This is um, not at all linked to any stuff we've done. So feel free to copy, download, do what you need to. This is a step-by-step -step on how to create it. The way we did it it's from creating the folder to adding links to the room and then all the various tips we have along the way. And then helpful resources specifically on different games and books and websites we have as well. Each of this is kind of organized how we've organized our own folders, but are empty, of course, so that way you can fill them as you need. And then we have examples of like an example puzzle template or an example of some of our puzzles that we've done from both the campaigns, campaigns, well, we'll call them campaigns. Um, and then doo -doo -doo. also like for, um, I've also included the instructions and for our, so the form um, that we've used for each of the different puzzle hunts. So that way you can see, this is uh, one of the surveys and then this is the puzzle hunt itself. Um, a, a template of one that you can use as far as, and like I'll, we added kind of here, here's what you would want to put here and here's where you want to add this kind of thing, all that kind of stuff. So that way it's all templated and ready for uh, to roll for you. And this is what I was talking about with, nope, not forms. Why do I keep saying that? Ain't rules, tutorials, and intros. There we go. So that way you, um, one of the hardest things I found was figuring out how to do an FAQ and a tutorial and setting up the rules and expectations. So please feel free to use that um, as much as you want because the hardest thing I think was getting people to understand the experience of what they're going into if they've never done an escape room. So bracketing that experience, I think we spent a lot of time going back and forth about what we wanted the rules and tutorials to say. So I, I just added that wholesale so that way you guys can take whatever verbiage you want and go ahead with your own rooms. Um, and the, the link for the ALA mystery hunt is in the chat too. So you can kind of see how that all came together <laughs> when you're looking at those resources. Um, so back to some of our questions, um, next up, uh, talking about like the images that you used for the escape rooms. So how did you go about deciding the places for the escape rooms and creating those? And I know you mentioned the noun project, but were there any other resources you used for that? Um, I'll try not to get too technical so that we can respect everyone's time. Um, for the first set of images for LibLearn X, uh, myself and another um, one of the Sarahs of GameRT, um, we split up the images. So she did two slides, I did two slides. Um, I think we both worked in Photoshop and we actually assembled them in a couple different ways. I think she hand drew and colored some of uh, one of her images. Another one was just completely photoshopped images from different clip art areas. I did one that was all noun project uh, downloads and another that was uh, my own clip art uh, assemblage collage. Um, that was probably more time intensive than it needed to be. So for annual, we made it a little more streamlined. I was the only one assembling the images. So it went a little faster. Uh, well, it didn't go faster, but it, I, I had, uh, I had executive uh, authority on there. Um, so we did it all in Canva and I really recommend, it really showed me how great Canva Pro is because of the clip art that you have access to. Um, if you can get a Canva account for, if, if you are a nonprofit uh, for free, you can get the Pro account uh, and it's worth it for the extra uh, image library. Um, so all of that was drafted in Canva and like we had the theme and we just riffed on it and tried to, you know, tried to hide as many jokes as we could in there. So that's why there's a taco truck on a beach. Why is it there? We don't know. We just think it's funny. Um, you can also do some of the Canva um, images also have like mini image uh, animations to them too. I don't think we were able to incorporate that in this section, uh, this round, but maybe in another one. Um, and I was, yeah, I was literally able to find everything I needed for um, that matched with our story in Canva, the Canva Pro uh, image library. Um, and they were pretty good about having diverse representation when I went to look for different um, people images. 
Um, does that answer all of that? I think so. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions about images. Alrighty, and then, so uh, once it's all put together and you're ready to market and advertise, what kind of marketing and advertising did you uh, end up doing for these escape rooms? So thankfully, um, because uh, for Libler Next, we were doing it for ALA specifically, they just had a banner right up there in the middle of Live Learn X's virtual experience that said, play this game. And everybody did. We had, I think, 64 people playing each day, which was nonsense. Especially they were playing each day of the conference. They were going to conference as well. So it's like, I don't understand. So the power of having something that says click here from ALA was fantastic because annual was a little different experience because it was a kind of hybrid model. and competing against physical stuff with virtual experience was very difficult. Even though we had a couple of shout outs, it wasn't the same level of here's the you know experience, even though um, for both cases, we had advertised for all of our round tables and we had done a Twitter and a write up about the experience. Um, for annual, I think we had 150 clicks overall, but only I think five uh, finishes. And that there were two different experiences. So there's a couple of different reasons why that might be, but still overall, I think virtual did much better when it was just virtual and virtual advertising versus a kind of hybrid model kind of competing. And um, I know, at least I've talked with you about this a little bit, Danielle, um, but just to talk about that hybrid model a little bit more, um, and the challenges of getting someone who's like exploring the conference hall to spend like hours on this puzzle. Like what tweaks do you guys see? Are you already thinking about changes going forward? We are, especially um, it's a level of complexity that we kind of hadn't thought about how complex the puzzles we make are and how much easier it is to solve them when you're in front of a computer versus when you're in person. So we had a breakout box experience, um, worked with breakout.edu, they're a puzzle making um, platform for education. And we had the same puzzle, both virtually on their platform and in the physical breakout box form. And while it was shiny and wonderful and people were like, oh, why are there so many locks? What's going on? There, we had a couple, like maybe a handful, six dedicated people over the whole, whole um, conference, but it was more like it was a showpiece rather than an experience of playing things. And I had one of our simpler puzzles in paper format where kind of people are like, oh, it's a flyer. It's like, well, it's a puzzle, but competing against the whole conference was really hard because people were in and out and they wanted to do so many different things. And it's like, oh, okay, I understand the mode has to be so much quicker. And I think maybe a handout format for our puzzle, like where they can take it and then be able to play it will be more successful. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great experience to kind of see the difference between two different conferences, a virtual conference and a um, in mostly in-person conference and see what we would need to change and do. So I'm very excited about for the future. And it, yes, it was a little disappointing to have only five people finishing, but what's nice and wonderful about uh, these kinds of puzzles is that I can use them forever. In five years, nobody's gonna know what my puzzle is. And I can just roll it out almost exactly the same, checking for links, of course, and then it's good to go. Um, we're also going to use for International Games Month, um, be rolling out these puzzles, not just to ALA members and games roundtable members, but to everybody who wants to play as well. So they're, even though we put a lot of work into them, they can still be reused over and over again. And then we have a question um, coming through Q&A and chat. How long did you expect that it would take people to finish uh, this for annual for this escape room? Annual, I think, what do we say? Like each three to six hours of play, depending on how good you, like each room's like an hour, I think. And so depends on like, but that's an hour for somebody that knows puzzle. So three to six, I feel would be fair. And the idea was we left it open until um, the Friday after everybody got back because it was 
just not fair to be competing against you're at conference and probably in a different city versus with live learn x experience we're like you're gonna be at home it's fine please play our nonsense um, and i think we tried to organize it so that people could play in chunks depending on what kind of time they had so you could do it all at once you can do the entire puzzle um on one day but you could or you could just do a, like an hour every day that you attended we tried to organize it that way yes and uh george our our international games month chair has put the link for international games month in the chat so if you're running gaming programming in november uh please make sure to sign up your library for international games month and potential giveaways and and fun community things that we'll be doing in November. Uh, the link is there in chat and I will copy that over for our Twitch folks too. Um, but another thing I just, that just popped into my brain um, for future conferences, if there's like a subset, like a smaller puzzle subset where people can complete it and come to our booth to get a ribbon that says that they you know, did this part of the puzzle would be super fun. <laughs> Thank you for ideas. Excellent. <laughs> um, so after marketing uh, and advertising, it's time to roll this thing out and get it uh, to the public. So we talked a little bit about what the experience was from, you know, virtual to, um, that hybrid annual experience, but how do you go about monitoring the puzzle once it's live and, you know, keeping up with questions that might be coming in and, and all of that? I don't think it did as much monitoring with LibLearn X. Um, it was mostly like checking the Facebook group to see like, is anybody asking questions? Um, I don't remember, I think it was, using the discord at that point I probably wasn't checking it as regularly as I do now um, but this is one of the things that as we were going into annual um, we really decided we needed like a hashtag or something where we could more easily find people talking about the game um, and this is something that uh, because we had lower engagement at ALA it was hard to tell like how well that worked um, I know I split the time with Sarah Reed to do uh, monitoring for annual because I was not at the conference so I was able to kind of keep an eye um, and so I just kind of searched the hashtag searched the Facebook group and the discord for questions there weren't as many um, for annual. Um, but speaking of ideas, it did give me the idea that we had the hashtag in just a couple of places um, this time, but maybe a good idea would be to add the hashtag as like a header or footer for the Google Docs for the puzzles going forward so it's more visible. Um, I think that would make monitoring a lot easier. Um, yeah, I don't, I didn't do as much of the monitoring for LibLearnX. And I unfortunately did all of it because I didn't realize we needed to monitor things. Um, that was one of our changes we made between them because with LibLearnX, I was like, uh, I'll put, I'll make a Facebook group, it'll be fine. Um, and then like made a little discussion so that people could ask questions. And we had a lot of questions. A lot of people were struggling with various parts of the puzzles. On Twitter sphere, I didn't realize people were talking about the puzzle, but there was no hashtag for them to use. And so it was like, oh, we need to make spaces for that we direct people in our FAQ and the tutorial to go to. And it's like, if you have questions or concerns, these are the places. So instead of, I had to keep trolling everything versus, okay, I just need to look at these few dedicated spaces. So that was one of the things we did better this year was making sure in the game rules, they knew these are the places, if you have questions, they'll be monitored at normal human hours, not at three in the morning, that kind of thing. Um, and then as far as the, you just mentioned the rules, so for building the rules and, you know, FAQs for people, um, how did you go about building the guides and how did you decide what to put in the guides and, and the rules or the FAQ? I think thankfully um, playtesting helped inform a lot of this build um, and it was a big group work document where we're like okay well we need to have both we need to have some kind of way of 
having them play this thing. And so as the um, players were asking questions, we were adding it to our FAQs, to our tutorials, that kind of thing. Um, and it, it turned out to be a big group project where we're like, oh, we should probably ask this. Or if I was somebody who didn't know anything about games, what might I ask? Or, oh, we definitely need them to know this is the area we need them to go if they have questions. So it was kind of um, created as an, the, once we had everything done, how to now like now we need to now have them navigate the experience all right and so the one of the final sections for questions we have on our pre-made list we've talked about a little bit um the difference between libler and x and annual and going from that fully virtual mode to a hybrid mode but do you guys have any other thoughts about things that you might change going forward or if anybody um, still watching here has questions that we have not answered yet please feel free to throw those in chat or the q a i think um for me when i was solving the puzzles before it even went to the play testing mode I would always, you know, have my pen and paper and be writing everything down, or I would sometimes print some of them out, like for the crossword puzzle and stuff. Um, and so I think it's a good idea and a suggestion that came up from, from today. I think, Danielle, you said it, maybe have like a printed sheet, you know, of stuff if we're in person. Um, and so that that could be, that could work too. So that if you're doing this hybrid model, people can play the same puzzles virtually, but then you also have it printed out and you can make your notes and stuff. Um, physically too. Question from chat, what kind of accessibility testing did you do with your puzzles? I want to say this was largely left up to the individual. And then as play testing happened, people with different areas of expertise or experience could be like, hey, that's a problem. Like my boyfriend is colorblind. And so if somebody used black and red to be able to differentiate between text, I can be like, that doesn't quite work. You might want to think about adding an extra thing like underlining, which you're wanting to stand out. Um, I know with mine, um, I tried to stick with kind of a basic format for puzzles where there wouldn't be accessibility issues. Um, like with Twine, it's all HTML. And so I know that that's as accessible as any other website. I'm not getting crazy. I don't have those coding skills. Um, but at least from what I remember, it was largely like we talked about it in our meetings to be like, remember, this is the focal point. Like drag and drop is not accessible. Let's just avoid puzzles that use that. Um, so it was generally there in the discussion and then something that was pointed out as we were playtesting I think a lot of us had it in mind as we were engaging with other people's puzzles like oh this could be a problem I am muted <laughs> I don't see any other questions coming in through chat at the moment. Um, but are there any final words or thoughts that the four of you would like to share before we wrap up? If, if okay, this sounds like excited. what you want to do, you should volunteer for the <laughs> next one. <laughs> We will be doing Libler Next. Thank you for plugging, Liz. Um, so Libler Next, NOLA, we are going to try once again a hybrid experience, see how that goes. Um, so if you like puzzles, if you like the idea of um, working on escape rooms, if you just like our beautiful faces and want to chat with us more, I will take everybody and anybody. We have a really chill kind of atmosphere when we're building things. So it's a big group collaborative effort. Um, if you'd like to join, please definitely come. Um, but no, I love all these people. They're fantastic and wonderful and have built amazing puzzles with me. And so I think kudos for all their hard work because we couldn't do it without everybody. And Danielle is a great organizer who makes sure that all the little boxes get ticked and that we actually attend all our meetings. <laughs> I would also say that if you've never built an escape room before, it does not have to be as detailed or big as the ones that we did for Live, Learn, X or ALA. Um, you can do it with the Google form and just a few puzzles, um, like fairly simple puzzles as you're starting out. 
and it's super fun. And, <laughs> and I think, I, oh, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Dania. No, oh ahead. no, it's when you're building the puzzles, they can be very, very low level. Like they don't have to be complicated at all because in your head, you're like, oh no, will anybody answer it? And then it's like, everybody's like, what did you do, Danielle? What is this nonsense? You're, the puzzles are always more difficult than you're like, they want simple puzzles. They want the aha moment when they're playing. So definitely give them that. You don't have to make something labyrinthine and complicated like I love to do. Um, you can just give them a very easy puzzle and let them have a fun experience. And I put in chat, I'm gonna put it in here again, um, the link for the Game RT volunteer form. So if, if you are interested in helping to build puzzles um, or any other Game RT stuff, writing for our blog, volunteering for our committees, helping us make fun programs like this webinar that you are attending now, um, fill out that volunteer form. IGM, yes, help with International Games Month. Um, I like to think we're one of the more fun round tables. I mean, we've got games and games are fun. So come hang out with us. I made puzzles for work. I did yeah. cryptograms for work. <laughs> They're the best. The, those meetings are always like the ones I look forward to. I'm like, oh, I know I'm going to have an hour and we're just going to talk about like puns and story yep. and puzzles and this is and it's hard events. work and I live in a cubicle land and everybody's like Danielle what was that meeting you sounded so serious but you're like the taco truck needs to have yellow <laughs> or like it's other things like the talking squirrel seems a little small for this puzzle and I don't think people will be able to find it in the magical forest where so. is the rick roll gonna occur this time yeah there's always always there must be a rick roll Yes, and um, our board meetings are super fun too. We have those every month, so you can look forward to a fun hour of just chatting about games and libraries every month if you come to our board meetings. Um, I am going to throw our social links into the chat once more so you can find us on Twitch and Facebook. We have a Discord server. If you're not there, come join us on Discord. We have all kinds of fun game conversations um, we've got a Facebook group that's super active and we post all of the links for our uh, monthly board meetings there. Uh, make sure that, again, you use that volunteer form if you want to work with us in any way, shape or form. And I will look forward to seeing all those forms come in and I'll get them funneled to all of the appropriate people. Um, so thank you uh, everyone who attended today to listen to this awesome chat about building mysteries for your library and thank you Amber and Danielle and Celine and Liz and Sarah's not here but she did a lot of work for this thank you Sarah too. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing all of the stuff that you learned <laughs> throughout this process. Uh, so if you have any questions, please let us know. You can reach GameRT. I'll throw our email in the chat while I'm at it. Uh, but you can email us, find us on our on our socials, and we will get back to you with whatever info you're looking for. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, and we will see you at our October session, or October. We'll see you in October, but we're going to see you in August first. We'll see you in our August session soon. <laughs> enjoy the rest of your day, y'all. <laughs> Bye.